praise the Lord. Praise, praise the, the Lord, Lord, everybody. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Yes, it is. Amen. And aren't you glad you're not a, 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 a fair weather saint? Amen. Amen. I'm glad I'm not a fair weather saint. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because I tell you, if I was a fair weather saint, I'd be laying up home. <laughs> Watching the video like some people I know, and he's yeah. asking me to stop at Bojangles on my way home. So. Oh, really? Yeah. What so we having? Uh, <laughs> I'm not stopping at Bojangles. <laughs> you can get yeah, where you want to. They're texting me. Hey, sis. Yeah, just tell her, hey, because I, no, ma'am, that's not working. <laughs> Well, 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 well. Welcome to First Church International Ministry. Amen. A place where God caters unto you. Amen. Yes, amen. He caters to our soul to give us a new life in amen. Him. A new way. Amen. 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 A newness, a new mind, a new spirit. Amen. A new heart. Amen. amen. A new walk. A new amen. talk. Amen. 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 All geared for us to be able to fit into our new home. Amen. amen. In the kingdom of God. So, Welcome to Personal Touch International Ministry, amen, where we are experiencing a new life in Christ Jesus, amen? Amen. 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 Son of man, 
I made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest them not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his eye, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet, if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he is born, also thou hast delivered thy soul. Hallelujah to God. Amen. 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 Thank and praise God for his word. Amen. Amen. His word is true. Thank God we can't get past it. We can't get away from it. Amen. 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 If you're in this gospel, you're going to do it God's way. <laughs> Amen. All right. We're going to do a new one. Actually, it's a new three. But Amen. Well, I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me Took back what he stole from me Took back what he stole from me I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me He's under my feet He's under my feet Just in time, I'm gonna praise 
laughing while you talking about Bo Jango, so you need to be rehearsing with them. <laughs>
there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> we do open up our testimony service. Amen. 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 For us to be able to give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Amen. For all that he's done. Amen. Amen. Whether it was just one thing or ten things, but for all that he's done. Amen. Amen. In you, amen, yeah. in the house, amen. Yes. So we just thank and praise God. And as, as Sister Jasmine just loves to say, I stand and I'll start first, amen. Ah. <laughs> amen. Amen. So we do bless the Lord, amen. We do give honor to God who is the head of my life, amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, God, and I'm so thankful to be able to say that, amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I do give honor, amen, to our elder, elder right in the house. Amen to our elder on Facebook that's viewing us, Elder LaGree, amen. Give honor to Sister Jasmine, amen. Sister Mary and their absence because they're home with babies with the flu, amen. And give honor, amen, to Brother Mark, amen. Sister Jamie, I just give honor to all the people, amen, of God that are loving God, amen, today on this rainy day, amen. Amen. I give honor to those that are not seasonal, amen. <laughs> Well, well, the things, amen. But we just thank and praise God, amen, for what God is doing, amen. And I know a lot of times when I say that, people, what is he doing? What is he doing? You can look at me and say, tell he's doing what an almighty God can do and will do, amen. Because he's keeping the devil's hands off of me. He's keeping me out of the path of the devil, amen. And keeping me into his path of righteousness. His word of God lights up every step of the way for me. That I'm able to be led in God and understand, amen, which way he's taking me. So I thank and praise God, amen. I know it's the holidays that man perceives, but I'm telling you, every day with Jesus is a holiday, amen. Every day in Christ is a day to be thankful for, amen. Not just no prepared meal or whether I'm hungry, whether sick, well, or whatever the case may be. Every day of a day of Thanksgiving to my father, amen. And I love what he's done. I love it even the more as he allowed me to reach these ages in numbers according to this human body, amen. I love and praise him even the more because I know that this spiritual body is not aging at all, that it is just it desiring and loving to praise God, amen. I thank you, praise God, that he's kept me closed in my right mind, amen. He's given me the will, the ability to know, to do, and to understand his will and his way, amen. And I praise God, and the devil can't take that away from me. The devil can't touch what God has done. Why? Because I'm so willing. I'm faithful toward the word of God and I'm willing to do the will of God. Amen. Amen. Because he shut the devil's mouth, but we got to be willing to do what God said. All, oh, not what we want to perceive, not what we want to desire. I thank and praise God that when he calls me out of darkness, he turned the light out when I walked into his marvelous sight. He turned the light out to my past. So therefore, I don't have to see it. I don't have to remember it. I don't even have to try to imagine what it was like. Amen. Because the light of God keeps enough light in my mind, spirit, soul, and body in this life, in the earth, that I don't have to look back. Amen. I praise God for life, health, and strength. I praise God for all that he does, all that he says. And even if he don't speak to me today, I got his word in my heart. Hey, God, I thank you. I got his word in my heart that it doesn't matter whether God audibly speaks himself or impress it upon my heart. I got the word of God. And that word is alive and well in me. Amen. And I thank and praise God. I thank you for the truth. Amen. I see, round right about this time of year, people need the truth. Yeah. They need it every day, every time of the year. But they need it today. They need it today because they need to know that Jesus is Lord and not Santa Claus. Oh. They need to know that Jesus is Lord, hallelujah, and not the fact that your credit card is at its limit, amen. They need to know that Jesus is Lord. And then they will not buy you anything or not. I love you wholeheartedly. Yes. Unconditionally, I love you. Yeah. Oh, but I thank and praise God that I can love all mankind. One thing, like I said, he, I, I stick with. He said that you are the respect and belief of all mankind. I respect everybody's belief. I respect whether you believe.
believe Christ, whether you are atheist, whether you, whatever you are, homosexual, lesbian, I don't care, but I respect your belief, amen? Because God told me to. But one thing about it, I'm going to let my light so shine. I will not allow the light of God that he's placed in my life to go out because of what somebody else want to do. I'm not a follower like that, amen? I just thank and praise God, but like I said, all is well, all is well, that we can continue to go on and talk about the greatness of God, the goodness of God, because salvation is an awesome thing as to what he's done and what he's doing in our lives, amen. No, I have not arrived, but I tell you, I'm striving. <laughs> I have not arrived in this thing, but I tell you, when it's time to run, I run. When it's time to walk, I walk. When it's time slow pace, I do so. But whatever the will of God desires, see, not what I desire, but what the will of God desires in me, that's what we do. Amen? Amen. So we just said, you know, give God thanks, give God praise. Amen? Because see, he's God alone. Whether we give it to him or not, he's still going to be glorified. And I tell you, he's going to honor that son. He's going to be glorified whether we're going to do it or not. But I choose to do it. Amen? Because see, he's put it put himself in me to glorify him in the earth realm so as it is in heaven. So I tell you, whatever I'm doing in heaven, I'm going to do it down here in the earth by rejoicing. Amen? Amen. That's my testimony. Any more testimony? I'm going to give one, but I'm going to give it when I, well, I can give it now. Amen. I just thank God because he's good. We got a good report from the doctor this week. All right. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And, and so we're good to that. And yeah. I'm just thanking him. I'm thanking him already. I'm just standing in faith that he's healing my mom even as we speak. And Amen. I just thank God for who he is. Amen. He is, he is awesome. He's, we were talking about that earlier this week. God is just awesome. Mm -hmm. he, he speaks, he tells you, he gives you confirmation when you ask him questions. Yes, he does. And I just thank him for that. Yes, he does. He's just awesome. God's awesome. He's an awesome God. Amen? Amen. And that's my testimony. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Give an honor and praise the Lord. Amen. Um, to the apostles, the shepherd of this household, all to all the saints here in Addison. Uh, just want to thank the Lord for giving me another opportunity to come into his house and praise. And uh, just giving a prayer for all the ones who are going to be traveling during this holiday season. Uh, be safe and uh, that the Lord is traveling mercy and everything. And let his will be done. And Amen. Know that this season of the holidays isn't about presents and Santa Claus and everything. It's about that uh, Part of the real reason of uh, the Jesus, of Jesus in our lives and everything, um, and that uh, the togetherness of the families, if everyone's doing all that type of stuff. So, Amen.
car in front of us. A major accident. Amen. Amen. Like, wow. Amen. And you know, I had to take a minute and thank God. I was Amen. like, I didn't need a sign. Amen. I didn't ask for a sign. Mm -hmm. But thank you for the sign. Amen. You know, I was grateful for it. Yeah. I didn't need it, but Amen. I was thankful for Amen. it. You know. Amen. And
after our Sunday morning worship on Sunday, December 24th, amen, to fellowship as we break bread together, amen, amen, amen. and we're inviting families and friends, amen, to join us in this Christmas Eve service, amen, and dinner, amen, afterwards. And this is not a Christmas show, amen, where you're going to see amen. Jesus born in a manger, amen. <laughs> Go ahead. And the children, amen, uh, you know, being the little wise men and all that kind of stuff, that's not what you're going to see, amen. With, you know, tradition and religion, amen. We're going to be business as usual, amen, in the spirit realm, amen. Yes. So we will be having service as usual, amen. amen. Preaching and teaching the word, amen, so yes. that your soul will be able to, um, what's that word? Your soul will become that incubator that Christ needs, amen, and Jesus yeah. needs, amen, to come forth in you, amen. 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 So we will need a head count to ensure that we will have enough food, amen, no later than today. Yeah. yeah. Sunday, December 17th, amen. 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 We will not be having a watch night service, amen, as we as I would love to do, amen. But we we um will be amen praying and, and, and bringing in the new year, amen, at our homes or wherever, amen, the Lord will permit you to be. Person Touch will also begin their um their uh, annual seven day fast, amen, that we amen. love to do, amen, beginning on the 31st of December, that Sunday evening at 8 o'clock, amen, and it will continue until that January the 7th, that Sunday at 6 a.m. in the morning, amen, and we are all asking all saints that can and will fast or deny and pray with us, amen, amen, amen. so with this, this is our announcement, amen. Amen, Brother Mark, you can go ahead on and pray on the offer, please, sir. Lord, we thank you again for bringing us this day to come into your presence to praise and glorify your name. Lord, bless us all, friends. Bless those who gave. Bless them who had the heart to give. Bless them to go to the strength of your ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We turn it over to Elder. Amen. Elder amen. Right. Amen. amen. All right. Let's, let's get into this. Let's all stand. We're going to say our little prayer. We pray every time I preach. But at home, y'all pray it with us and y'all say, oh my goodness, why we always got to pray this prayer. Because I ask, and because if you pray it, the Lord's going to speak to you and he's yes, going to change your heart. Yes, he is. So if y'all will just repeat after me, say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, dear Jesus speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. And change my life. And change my life. In your precious name. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Father, I just ask this morning, Lord, that you lead me and guide me, that I would speak what you have laid upon my heart yes. with with authority, with power, with anointing. But Father, that it would not be my lips, but it would be your spirit that speaks. Yes. And I give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We're going to look at James chapter 3 and 4 today, and uh, the title of my message kind of has two titles. It's called Teaching from James, or, or and, The Preacher's Judgment. Amen. And I don't mean that the preacher is doing the judging, by the way, just, just so y'all don't get the wrong idea. This is the preacher's judgment because those of us who have been entrusted with the word of God are called to be proficient and obedient. However, this is, does not mean that these words don't have something for every believer because James, as he speaks, though he's directing these two chapters pretty much at ministers, He's, he's laying out a foundation because those who lead have to lead by example, right. especially in the church. Because if we want saints to be transformed, to be like Christ, guess who has to be being transformed and changed to be more like Christ first? That's us. Amen. 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 So the title of the message is Teaching from James and the Preacher's Judgment. So... We're going to jump right into this. Now, James, in chapters 3 and 4, he touches on five different things 
And, and I'm just going to lay these out for you so that you'll know where we're going. First, James talks about the positions of ministry and the judgment that comes to those who enter into those positions. Secondly, James covers the tongue. Ouch. And this is focused again on those in ministry. But all believers need to pay attention to this because how we speak and how we use our tongue is important. Thirdly, he talks about humility and wisdom. And that's something that all believers should have, is humility and wisdom. But it's especially true for those who are entering into or considering entering into the ministry. And I say that because I want anyone who is watching or listening today, if you believe that God is calling you into any form of ministry, you need to pay close, close, close attention. Because if you don't, and you get yourself into a position and you mess up, it's going to be painful. Fourth, fourth, James talks about the battle that goes on within each one of us. Here's this battle between our flesh and our spirit that is constantly going on. And so he discusses that. And then lastly, he talks about how fleeting life is. And that's going to be important here in a minute when I get to it. So, James chapter 3, verse 1. We're just going to go through this as, as we, we're going to talk about it as we read it. Verse 1, it says, Do not many of you become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. And that's pretty harsh. He starts off this chapter. He lays it out. And he says, this is where I'm going. This is what we're going to talk about. The fact that not many of you need to be teachers. And those of you who are, you need to understand. You should know. James says that. He says, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Amen. So going into it. You should know right off the bat, before anybody even tells you, before you, you get a certificate of ordination or, or whatever you get to become a teacher or a pastor or any of these positions, you need to know going in that your judgment is going to be stricter than anyone else's. That's right. and, and this goes for teachers, preachers, pastors, prophets, evangelists, bishops, elders, Apostles, all of us. That's right. So when, when you hear me use it, a lot of people say, you sure do use a lot of scripture. Look, I'm going I'm I'm to make this clear. I use a lot of scripture because it can say what, what the Lord won't say better than I can. And, and as long as I'm using scripture, you can't blame me. And... and, and because, because as I'm using scripture, it's going to be right. Amen. Amen. So, so I'm just saying, I know my judgment's going to be strict. And I'm not going to be that guy that stands before God and he goes, what were you thinking? Teaching that. I ain't going to be that guy. Amen. So, yeah. <laughs> so we've been entrusted with the word of God. But understand this, all believers have been entrusted with this That's word right. because we all are ministers in and of our own rights. In our circle of influence, you are a minister. You are a teacher. You are a preacher. You are an evangelist. You're a prophet. You, you go into your circle of influence and you become an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. So when you walk into the midst of those who don't know Jesus, you are entrusted with the gospel. And when you begin to present that, understand that God is going to be paying attention to how you present it and what you present. Amen. So, but like I say, he's mainly talking here about those in ministry, but we're all in those positions when we are among our friends, family, co-workers, and all these other things. In fact, the Bible, Paul tells us that we're supposed to prove or show that we're even approved to be in this position. Right. That we shouldn't be a novice, someone new, 
Um, and and when, when Paul says not to be a novice, he doesn't just mean new believers. I, I want to make this clear. Because there are a lot of people who have walked in the faith for 20, 30 years, and they're still a novice when it comes to the Word of God. Because right. they wouldn't know the Bible if it was thrown at them. And, and they've been in church. They, they see their Bible once a week, and that's when they pull it out of the trunk and take it into the church. When church is over, they take it back out to the car and throw it back in, in the trunk. They, they ain't read it since it was bought. They ain't even, the, the binding on it ain't even cracked where it's been opened once. Amen. <laughs> I'm just saying. Amen. Now, 1 Timothy says this. He says that, a, that a, a minister or an elder or an overseer in 1 Timothy 3, 6 should not be a new convert or should not be a novice. So that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation of the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Amen. So a novice is someone who, who is so weak. New converts and those who don't know the word, those who are novices in the word of God, are more apt to become conceited, become arrogant. If they're placed in those positions, those positions will puff them up like a puff fish, uh -huh. like a blowfish. Uh -huh. You ever seen one of them on TV when they get mad, they just go, yeah. well, that's what some people are like if they get placed in a position to teach. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.15 Paul tells Timothy, he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth, or rightly dividing, is what the King James says, I believe, it says rightly dividing the word of God. So if we're going to be a minister, we can't be a novice in the Word of God because a novice in the Word of God doesn't quite know how to rightly divide the Word. That's right, that's right. Because they don't know how, how do I take this, Lord, and, and say what you're saying there properly? These are the ones who end up pulling a, a one verse kicking and screaming out of the Bible and build their whole ministry on that one one verse. Amen. And it don't mean nothing about what they think it does. So we must not be a novice. First Thessalonians 2 4 says, But just as we have been we have been approved to God by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men. But God, who examines our hearts, for we never came with a flattering word, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. So what Paul's saying there is, look, I didn't come to you trying to make you feel good. Yeah. I wasn't telling you what you wanted to hear. God approved me, but when he approved me, he gave me this gospel and he entrusted it to me to speak the whole counsel of God and to speak it with authority, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit on it, to please him and not men. And, and there are a lot of people who they come into the faith and they get a little bit of a word in them and then somebody automatically tells them or sees them and places them in a place of teaching because they don't have anybody else. And so they put them in to teach. If you don't have, if that's the best you have to teach, don't have a class. Because it's better not to have a class than to put someone teaching a class that don't know beans. Amen. Amen. I used to I had a history teacher in high school, and that's what he used to say. You don't know beans, boy. And, and that's how some people are. That's right. That's right. And, and pastors and deacons and stuff, they'll look and say, well, we need somebody to teach this class. Well, Brother Joe's there. Brother Joe just got saved two weeks ago, but he's all we got. And they're like, well, I guess that's what we'll use. No. That's right. That's right. 
The Bible says, let them not be a new convert or a novice. They need to be someone who understands the word. They've had some discipling. So, and it's clear we must know the word of God, being able to understand it, being able to interpret it, being able to proclaim it with authority. There are a lot of teachers, they'll teach a class, and you can hardly hear what they're saying. They can have a, a, a PA system, and you still wouldn't. And the more amp you give them, the lower they talk. Because they're they're scared. If right. if you're placed in a position to teach, be bold. That's right, that's right. Now if you don't know the word, yeah, you need to be quiet. And there's some pastors out there need to be quiet. They're not pastors. That's right, that's right. They call themselves pastors, they wear the title of pastor, but they're not pastors. Because they don't fit the biblical requirements of being able to understand and rightly divide the word. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, he talks about the tongue. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the entire body as well. Now, we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us. We direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of, of the pilot goes. So also, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yes, it, yet it boasts of great things. Behold, how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. That's pretty harsh. Yeah, yeah. The tongue can defile your entire body and sets on fire the course of our existence. That's and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and birds, uh, reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These ought, these things ought not be so. And, and we're told that the tongue is, is a horrible thing. It, it, it'll direct the path of your life. And the reason being is because your tongue exposes what's in your heart. You know, when he first, he opens this up in, in verse 2, talking about the fact that we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the entire body. In other words, if you can control your tongue, you can control the whole body. Amen, amen. But unfortunately, most of us don't have that. We have the right to remain silent. We just don't have the ability. And... <laughs> See, there's no filter. We just let things go. And he talks about we, we all stumble in many ways. In Romans 3.23, Paul writes that we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, each one of us, which means even believers, whether we want to admit it or not, or whether we try or not, we sin. And we, we have to come to that realization. I know that's hard. Because everybody wants to think, I don't sin, I'm perfect, I've been good, I'm in Christ. Well, you may be in Christ, but I guarantee you, if you look at your life, there may be things you haven't done that you knew you should have, and you've done some things that you knew you shouldn't have, but you did them anyway. We all are guilty of that. That's what the Bible says. Look, listen to what John writes in 1 John. If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Yeah. But if we confess our sins, there's, there's the key. 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. So if I walk around and say, like one brother on, on TV says, I have, he made this statement, I haven't lied in 18 years since I've been saved. And I was sitting there thinking, you just did. He also said that in 18 years, he hasn't sinned. He said, it is, that you can be so full of Christ that you can just not sin. Now, if you say you haven't sinned, that's pride. If I make that statement, that's pride. And what is pride? Sin. So, throw that one right out the window. The life and the walk of a believer, we're not perfect. We're striving for it. We are. We strive for it daily. But even Paul said, I, I haven't attained that yet, but I press on. This one thing I do, I press on towards the mark, that high calling. I'm working on it. I'm moving closer and closer to it by the Holy Spirit in me. But as a believer, my walk is one of faith and repentance. As I'm being sanctified, the Lord brings up things to me and He shows me things that are in my life that I need to get shed of. And He helps me to do so by His Spirit. As I humble myself before Him and I allow Him to cleanse me out. So we do these things, but our tongue, what he says here, if you can if you can control your tongue, then you got the whole thing, man. If you can control your tongue and what you say with your mouth, then you're able to control your whole flesh because the tongue is the meanest part of the whole body. That little thing will set you afire. That's what he says. That's what the word said. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just saying what it says. It says that the tongue sets the course of our existence on fire. So I have to work on, on watching how I use my tongue. Because, like I said before, the tongue exposes the heart. In, in Luke chapter 6, verse 43, he writes this, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from bramble bush. The good man, out of the treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. The evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart. So whatever rules my heart is what's going to be on my tongue. That's, right. That's what I'm going to speak. Right. So he's saying you need to watch out because you see how such big ships are run by that little rudder. And your body, in comparison to the rudder on the ship, our tongue's way bigger in, in percentage-wise from the size of the ship and the size of the rudder. Our tongue's way bigger than that. So if a boat can be turned by the rudder, think. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> our, our tongue can get us in trouble. And, and here's why. Look at what he says. For in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. Our tongue is like our flesh. Why is the tongue so bad? Because it's part of our flesh. Yeah. So as part of the flesh, it is the very world of unrighteousness. Why does he say that? Because out of our heart, our, our tongue speaks, our mouth speaks what is seated in our hearts. And so the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. My tongue, Jesus said that it's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out that defiles him. 
said, whatever's in my heart, if I'm, if I'm, especially if I'm a preacher, if I'm an evangelist or someone like that, and I'm going places and I'm speaking the gospel, if I'm not careful, what is down in my heart is going to pass the filter, which most of us don't have one, and it's going to fly out. And the bad thing about that is, once it goes, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I ain't, I'm not like rodeo cowboys that can throw a lasso on it and pull it back. So, so it, it, it sets our, it, he goes on and he says, it defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our existence. And then he goes on and he talks about we've tamed every kind of animal on the world. We can get elephants to do tricks. We can tame lions to do tricks. We can get tigers to do tricks. We can get bears to do tricks. Dolphins, whales. But we can't control our tongue. Make one cut your tongue out for me, Pastor. Maybe well, you just say, just. I'm just going to sew my mouth shut. And there are some people that they might ought to. But that's what he's saying here. He says it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Whether we bless the Lord and whether we curse men. There are people that go into the church and they'll bless God. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, I love you, Jesus. And when they walk out the door, the first thing they do is cuss their wife out. And I'm not talking about just people in the congregation, friends. I'm talking about pastors. They will stand behind the pulpit. They will deliver a message. And as soon as they walk out the door, as soon as they get into the car, because little Johnny's been, been fidgeting on the second row, and mom was trying to do her duty as, as the pastor's wife and couldn't take care of little Johnny over there, as soon as they get in the car, he berates her because Johnny's misbehaving. And James says that should not be so. Our, our speech should be the same outside the church as it is in the church. That's right. So he, he speaks to that and he makes, makes that very clear. And so, and I'm going to finish part of this as we read this next section. Look at chapter, or look at verse 13. He says, "Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good conduct his works in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth." This wisdom is not coming down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and self-ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and of good fruits without doubting, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. If we'll turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 11. When Peter writes here, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners in exiles to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul by keeping your conduct excellent among the Gentiles. So in the, the thing which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good works, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So what Peter's saying is what, what same thing that James writes here in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding, let him show by his good conduct, his works in the gentleness of wisdom. So what we end up having here. It's people who they speak, and as they speak, like I said, the tongue betrays what's in our heart. So James is going on down here, and he's saying that if we're operating in, in earthly wisdom, if we're letting the flesh do our speaking, then what's in your heart is going to come out. 
And this is that battle that, that Paul talks about that we go through between our, our flesh and our spirit. There's this constant war that's going on. The flesh wants to rule. The, the flesh is dead set on ruling your being. And if the flesh can, can rule your being, he can take you to hell. Amen. Amen. And we're not to let this be so. See, in Scripture, in Colossians 3, 1, Paul writes, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching, and admon admonition, admonishing, goodness gracious, I can't talk, one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs singing with gratefulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So, so what we've seen, Peter says, your good works should testify against those who try to slander you. But if I'm, if I'm operating, like I said, he's, he's mainly talking to people in ministry here. He, he's trying to lay down this foundation for those in ministry that you have, to, you have to have a good conduct. You have to have good works that show that you're in Christ. Does that make sense? That, that the Lord wants us to always allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Because bad ministers... <laughs> which there are some those who are intent on their own motives Galatians 5.19 lays out who they are they operate in the deeds of the flesh which are evident sexual immorality well what if they're not having an affair and watch how they look at women in the church I've seen pastors they might as well be wolves. They, they might as well just have long, they're drooling. Yeah, yeah. I'm serious, brother. There are people who will look at folks in their congregation and they will just be drooling. Yeah. That's sexual immorality. Yeah. Impurity. Sensuality. Always talking about certain things. Idolatry. Sorcery. Enmity. Strife. Jealousy. Outbursts of anger. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness. There are pastors who drink, who, who get drunk. They leave church and the first thing they do when they get home, pop a top. Carousing and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what, what James says over here in verse 4. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Because that wisdom doesn't come from above, but it's earthly, it's natural, it's demonic, it's witchcraft, it's sorcery. It is speaking those things which aren't true, even when you know the truth. Remember we talked about that a little bit in, in Sunday school this morning. The Pharisees and the scribes, they were, they were inconsistent in their behavior. And they were doing it for religious gain, for their gain, using the name of God. And so he's saying, don't be like this, because those kind of things, that's where jealousy and selfish ambition exist. And there is disorder in every evil practice. But then there's good ministers, hallelujah, there's a few, who submit to and follow Christ, crucifying their own desires. Galatians 5.22 tells how they act. They act in the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, faithfulness, being faithful to the Word of God. 
If, if, if you don't get anything out of that, if, you, if you're thinking that you've been called into ministry, if you're in ministry, if you, even when you go out, even if you're not in ministry, and you go out as a believer in the day, and you're talking to people around you about the, the Lord, be faithful to the Scripture. Don't just make something up. Somebody asks you a question, don't say, well, don't, if you don't know, tell them, I don't know. That's right. That's right. There's no shame in that. To not say that is arrogance and pride, and that will lead to a downfall. Verse 23 in Galatians 5, gentleness, self-control, uh, which starts with the tongue. And if you can't control it, cut it off. That's what Jesus said about things that make you sin, didn't he? He said, if your right hand makes you sin, cut it off. If your right foot makes you sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. So if your tongue gets you in trouble all the time, cut it out. <laughs> it's, it's better to be mute and go to heaven then have a tongue that just runs off on its own. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he says, against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. This war that, that we go, that we face, that we fight every day against our flesh, it's trying to, to take over. And the Spirit is trying to take over. And we're like, dear God, please come in and help me here. And he says that now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in step with the Spirit. As those entrusted with the Gospels, ministers first and believers must have a life that reflects the attributes of the Holy Spirit. If my life doesn't look like the Holy Spirit's working in it, I, I'm not saved. I said that. I said that out loud. <laughs> but understand, this battle, now we're getting into the battle itself when we get down to verse 4. But, but before we read it, I want to read what Paul writes in Romans 7. He says, for we know, Romans 7, verse 14 through 23, so you can write it down. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, having been sold into bondage under sin. For what I am working out, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now no longer am I the one working it out, but sin which dwells in me, that flesh that wants to take over, it's constantly trying to take back its place. Yeah. For I know that nothing, nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For the, the willing is present in me, but the working out of the good is not. My, my spirit's willing, That's right. but the flesh ain't. That's right. That's the flesh says, uh-uh, Spirit, you may want to do good, but I don't. Amen. I want to drive this bus. Amen. You ever seen people that can't get along and somebody wants to drive the car and the other one don't want to let them drive and they'll argue and fuss? Eventually, somebody's got to get out of the car. Because yeah. they've got to be put out of the car. Well, that's how the flesh is with us. For, for it, it's always working out of the good is not. For verse 19, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil thing I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one working it out, but sin which dwells in me. And I find this principle that in me evil is present, in me who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur that the law of God in the inner is in the inner man. But I see a different law in my members, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a captive to the law of sin, 
which is in my members. He says, look, I'm doing this, but every time I try to do good, evil's right there with me. That's right. That's right. Now, now, I want you to notice, he says, with me, not in me. That's right. Now, my flesh is still there. But the evil that wants to take over my flesh, the one that wants to drive my body, is there beside me. And the Spirit is telling me, don't do that. But my flesh is like, I want to so bad. And it's this war. So now we look at what he says in chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members, in your body. You lust and do not have, so you murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel and do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. Right. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. In other words, God wants my spirit in control. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the, to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Be subject, therefore, to God. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and cry. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So what he's saying here, you, I know this battle's going on. Our, our battles, are that's what brings war in the world, is this conflict that's going on between good and evil is fighting in this world. Satan wants control of the world. God, It's God's world. And Satan don't like it, so he uses man in his flesh. He, he builds it up, burns it up, sets it ablaze, and it sets apart wars. But that goes on in each and every person's body as well. Yeah. Yeah. Satan is bound and determined to kill you yes, he is. Yes, he is. and me. Yes, he, is. he does everything that he can to get us to destroy ourselves. And he gets us to destroy ourselves by this, this inner conflict going on between the lusts and the passions of this world and, and that desire to know the God who created me. So he's pushing at me constantly and constantly. Paul puts it like this in verse 24 in Romans 7. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I find myself with my mind serving the law of God, that which is pure and holy. But on the other, my flesh is serving the law of sin. My flesh, it wants what it wants. That's right. That's right. The flesh is, is greedy. The flesh is selfish. Yes, yes. It don't care. If it, if it kills you, the flesh wants what it wants. Right. Look, at, look at people who, who are addicted to heroin and, and drugs or they're, they're involved in just perverse sex and things like that to bring about sexually transmitted diseases that kill, not just, not just make you sick, but that kill you. Yeah. That is the flesh getting its way. And the flesh wants what it wants regardless of whether it kills it or not. That's right. That's right. Hmm. And that's because Satan is the driver of the flesh and he wants you dead. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he is. So he, he fuels that passion. He fuels that lust yeah. that's in the body. And so like Paul, we should cry out, wretched man that I am, who, who is, is going to deliver me 
See, Paul understood, I can't do this. I cannot deliver myself. I can't win this fight on my own. Because if I try to fight it on my own, my flesh is going to win. And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I find that my mind is serving the law of God. It wants to do what's right so that my spirit is in, in tune and in unison with the Holy Spirit of God. But my flesh is constantly wanting to take part in the law of the sin. But thanks be to God. We're kind of like Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see Israel out on the battlefield and they're facing the Philistines. Well, the Philistines only have one warrior who's willing to come out and fight. But this one guy has the whole army of Israel shaking in their boots. Because he's standing on the hill crying out, Who can come and fight me? If you come and fight me and defeat me, you can take us all. But if I defeat one of you, then we get you and your spoils. That's how we are with sin. Our flesh stands there and cries out, Who's going to fight me? We were watching last night, and this video was talking about how people always try to make the story of David and Goliath makes, tries to make us David. We're not David. Because if we're David, that means we can do it ourselves. And that the giant Goliath represents our problems. And that if we're just strong and we go out, we can take down that giant. No, you can't. But that's what the flesh is like with us. Our flesh is standing out there screaming at us, knowing that in my own ability, in my own strength, I'm incapable, utterly incapable to defeat it. Just like Goliath knew, there was no one in the camp of Israel, in the army, that could defeat him. Because he heard the armor clanking with them shivering. Yeah. He saw them white as a sheep mm -hmm. because they were afraid. But just like for us, God sends David this little runt, mere boy. He's not muscular, which, as a side note on this, I just got to say this. All these things about Samson being real big and everything, Samson was tiny. He was just a regular man. What made him strong was that his, he had long hair. As long as he did what the Lord said, he would be strong. That's why people were amazed at his strength. But it was because God was with him. But, but here God sends David, this little runt. He's not strong. He's not mighty looking. He has no muscles. He, he has no armor. He has no sword. He has no helmet. All he's got is a sling and five little rocks. And he walks out to the giant and he takes his sling and he takes him down. And then takes the giant's own sword. And cuts his head off. That's a picture of Jesus. How he does for us. We can be shaking in our boots. And our flesh can have us so afraid. Because we have these, these temptations. We have these things. That it wants us. It's trying to draw us. To answer our passions. But then. But God, but God, he sends for us Christ. And there's nothing of beauty that draws us to him. The Bible says he wasn't a handsome man. It wasn't his good looks that drew people to him. He wasn't like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was just a, he looked like a regular man. 
and he wasn't physically overpowering. But Jesus, he comes, and like David had, had just a sling and a stone, Jesus comes with a cross. He's carrying a cross on his back, bruised, beaten, and bloody. And he stands before the enemy of our soul. And he lays, they lay the cross down, and he lays down on it, and he allows them to drive nails, spikes through his wrists and through his feet. And then they raise him up, and then they pierce his side. And he makes this one statement, it is finished before he dies. And when he makes that statement, the world, the devil, and the flesh fall before him. That's right. That's right. Defeated. Knowing that now they have no power over me mm -hmm. as a child of God. Because my Redeemer, the Son of David, who defeated the giant. Now his offspring has come and he's defeated sin and death in my flesh. And if we submit to God, now I have the ability to resist the devil. That's right. But it's not me. Because I couldn't. Remember? I was shaking in fear right. because of my flesh. I was shaking in fear because I knew I couldn't resist this temptation on my own. But in Christ, you know, because Christ lives in me and because he has put to death my flesh as I've laid it on the cross alongside of him. It's been crucified. Now it has to come into submission to Christ in me. Amen. That's how I win this battle that we see going on. And when, when James says you're an adulteress, you don't know that friendship with the world is hostility to God. Well, I can't not be a friend of the world in my own abilities. That's right. That's right. Because the world is always trying for me to come and take part. He's always trying to tease me and, and draw me in with, with something new, something, well, there's nothing new, but it, it puts it in a new new packaging to try and get me to come. That's right. But now I've submitted to God in Christ, and now I can resist the devil in Jesus' name. Now I can draw near to the Lord, and he draws near to me. And when that happens, the devil has to flee because now... He has no fight. That's right. Because the one that's now in me and with me, surrounding me, covering me, all he's got to do is look at him. Because he's a defeated foe. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And he knows he's a defeated foe. He can't stand it when someone... Who's, who's battling, who's struggling, especially a believer who's, who's having these, these things draw at them and pull them. And the longer we're disconnected, see, here's what happens with believers. They, they get to where they think, well, I'm doing good. I can dismiss church for three, four weeks. I'm good. I, I've got it on my own now. But then the next thing you know, that something changes. They begin to take part in something that they wouldn't have took part in a few weeks ago. And then the longer they're disconnected from this body of believers, they can lift them up and strengthen one another. And the next thing you know, the devil shows up now. And then there's this fear that comes over. But God. As they begin to see what's going on in that tub begins, and they suddenly remember, I know where I had strength. And I can't do it on my own, but I know if I can go back to the cross, if I can go back to that banner that's raised up high, 
that, that draws that, that is supposed to draw all men to it. In in the Middle Ages, when when armies would go out to war, the knights they would carry standards. Because in the middle of those battles, you couldn't tell who was who. They would be out there, and they would fight their own people if they weren't careful. And if they got separated, if they looked around them and they saw that they were in the midst of, of the enemy there, they could look for that standard that was raised up. And that was a rally point where if you get separated or you get cut off, get to the standard. And that's what the cross is for us. When we get caught up, when we're being beat up by the world when our flesh is trying to take us down, we can look up and we can see the cross and that's our banner that we run to. Because when I run to that, then suddenly I'm infused with that strength that comes through the blood of Christ and His presence in me. As I wrap myself, I draw near to Him and He draws near to me. And then I can resist the devil and say, in Jesus' name, leave me alone. And he has to flee at that name. That's right. That's right. But I can't just say it if I'm not drawing near to Christ. That's right. That's right. Ask the sons of Sceva about how that worked out. I have to be in him. I have to be near him. That's right. So we have this battle going on here. And then down in verse 12. Look what he says. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. That's the one we're running to because he's, he's the one who's able to save me. He's the one who's able to destroy the enemy that's trying to take me down. And friend, your flesh will take you down in a heartbeat. If you are not careful... Because the flesh is subtle. And the devil is subtle. He don't show up dressed in red with horns and a pitchfork. Last. Look at verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a place and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Verse 14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. And all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows to do right, and does not do it to him it is sin. He closes out with this thing about that battle going on again. He says, I've told you that there's this war going on and you know the good you ought to do. And if you don't do it, then you're, that's sin. Remember back at the beginning, I said, we believers, we, a lot of believers have this idea that once they get saved, they don't sin no more. I'm just good. I'm good. I can go on. I got this handled. Yeah. But, but see, there's two kinds of sin. There's sins of commission, and then there's sins of omission. Amen. Now, the sins of commission are easy ones to kind of figure out. You know, if I'm lusting after somebody, if I'm doing something, I steal something, I murder something, I, I'm, I'm, it's an active sin. But sins of omission sometimes are a little bit harder to see because I may know that I need to do something, but I don't do it. Well, that's sin. If the Lord opens up an opportunity for me to witness to someone and I blow it off, we read our scripture every Sunday, Ezekiel 3, 17 through 21. And the Lord said to Ezekiel, I made you a watchman. If I use you to talk to someone who's in sin and you don't tell them they're in sin and they're going to hell and they die and go to hell, guess what? Their blood's on your hands because you failed to do what you knew you should have done. 
But if I tell you to speak to them and you do speak to them and warn them that they're going to hell and then they die and go to hell, well, you're good because their blood's on their hands. That's right. And the same thing goes for a believer. If we know a brother or a sister who's, who's sinning, who's doing things that we know they ought not do, and we confront and we don't confront them when the, when the Lord gives us an opportunity and they die in that sin, then I'm held accountable for that right. because I failed to do what I knew I should have done. Amen. So we must be careful here. But then up above, he, when he's talking about this, he's like, don't be arrogant about time. You, you think you have all the time in the world. But let me tell you this. What is your life? You're but a vapor. Do you know how long your life is in, in reference to eternity? <laughs> That's it. That's right. That's <laughs> and it's gone. A vapor. Quickly. In the span of eternity, 80 years is nothing. That's right. We don't know that we have we we are promised tomorrow. Yeah. Now this is for those of you now who may not know the Lord. Or those of you who once knew the Lord and have, have turned away. You've gone back. You've allowed the flesh to take control and drive the boat, so to speak. See, today is the day that it's time for us to understand my life is a vapor. I'm not promised tomorrow. I'm not promised to leave this place and get home. That's right. That's right. I, I'm not promised then I'll be even be able to walk out the door. I could finish preaching, close my Bible, and have a heart attack and, and fall over here dead. So I'm not promised another breath. Because James says my life is but a vapor. And as we think of that, here, here's what, what I want to close this out with, is I may get all this other stuff Right. I may be able to handle the Word of God. I may be able to divide it rightly. And, and I may have somewhat control of my tongue or at least be able to be humble before the Lord and allow Him to take control because I know in and of my own self, I can't control my tongue. And I must allow that the wisdom of the Holy Spirit is used in me. I'm not trying to do things in my own wisdom. So if I've got that part right, and then I understand that there's this battle going on and that I can't defeat the flesh on my own and I know that only in Christ can I win that. I may have all of that going. I may be good there. But then I get to this part and my arrogance tells me, you got plenty of time. Remember last time I spoke, I talked about people have this attitude is why do today what you can put off till tomorrow? And that's what James is telling us right here. He's trying to say, you don't have tomorrow. You're not guaranteed that time. So now we must look at it and say, if it's the Lord's will. Well, if it's the Lord's will, and I don't know the Lord, that's not a very good plan. Because if it's my time, and understand me, if you're watching this at home, understand me, God knows the day you're going to give up your breath. That's right. You have an appointment with death. The Bible says that we are appointed. We have an appointment with death. And there's only one per person. Nobody's getting out of life alive unless the Lord comes back. We're all going to die. Was we're here when Jesus comes. So the best thing to do now is to say, Lord, I, I need to get right with you because I don't know well, what tonight brings. I don't know if when I go to sleep tonight if I'm going to make it till tomorrow. People die in their sleep every night. They have a brain aneurysm or something happens and they never know it. Just boom. And there are people that will say, well, I'll just wait until till the last minute. And it's like they, 
Well, what if you get in a wreck? Well, I'll just have to pray and hope that I have, have a few seconds before I die to, to ask for forgiveness. Friend, it doesn't work that way. In fact, James says this. He says, you, you don't have because you don't ask. And when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. If I try to wait till that last moment on my deathbed, oh Lord, I, I want to do one of them, them crucifixion type repentances like the thief that was with you in paradise. And the Lord's like, have you lost your mind? That's not a very good plan. Because then your motive is for your own pleasure. Am I saying that there aren't people who get saved like that? I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the majority of people who wait and wait and wait like that, their plan is I'm going to do everything I can to, to please my flesh. And at the last minute, when I don't have a chance to have fun anymore, then I'll give my life to Jesus. That's mocking the cross of Christ. This rock that's mocking the price he paid to set you free. Because, friend, if you give your life to Jesus, then all that stuff that the flesh is trying to get you to do, you won't want to do it. You're not going to miss it. And the idea is, well, I don't want to miss the hanging out with my friends. I don't want to miss having fun. I don't want to miss this. You won't. When you sell out to Jesus, that's fun. Because guess what? You'll remember tomorrow what you did. You won't be hugging the John at 2 o'clock in the morning. You won't wake up and look over and wonder, who is that? So if that's you, either you, you don't know the Lord, or, or if you've known him and you've turned away, or, or you, you claim to be a believer, but you know deep in your heart that things aren't right, that you're really not saved because you keep letting the flesh win. Get out a Bible, because I know you got one. Everybody's got a Bible in their house. And find the book of Psalms, go to Psalm 51. See, I don't have to lead anybody in a, in a prayer. I don't have to lead somebody. Because David gives you a prayer and how to come before the Lord in repentance. Amen. In Psalm 51, he asks, he says, Be gracious to me according to your loving kindness, Lord. According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. You, you ask the Lord, Lord, wash me. Cleanse me in the blood of Christ. I know my transgressions. That, that it's against you and you only have I sinned. You ask the Lord, you tell him, I've sinned against you and you alone. I, I may have hurt other people, but it's against you. Yeah. Yeah. Purify me and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. And deliver me from my blood guiltiness. What does that mean? The murder that's in your heart? Well, I ain't killed nobody. You mad at anybody? The Bible says that's murder. And then he says, Oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. And if you can't do that, just cry out the name of Jesus. And as you cry out that name, I, I guarantee you, he will come where you're at. And he will tell you what else to say. But you can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. Pastor can't. Brother Mark, my wife Jamie, none of us can do it on our own. We all have to be walked through that process by the Holy Spirit and by the Lord to lead us to the throne 
and to bring us into his presence. That each one of us would, would repent and be washed in his blood and cleansed and made new. I'm for you. I'm for, I'm for people. God is for you. He doesn't want to kill you, but he will. God does not want to send anyone to hell. That was made for Satan. The Bible tells us that hell was made for the devil and his angels, not for man. So he doesn't want you to go. His desire is that all men be saved. And he's offering you the opportunity this morning. Don't let it pass you by. We're coming to the end of the year, and praise God, I hope we all make it. But today's the day to start next year and start it in Jesus. End out on a good note. A lot of people can't wait. They're going out on New Year's Eve and going party hardy and, and end out the new year. And some of them are going to end up dead before they even get home. You can end the year with a smile on your face, Jesus in your heart, and a new man, new life, like we sing every week. Have a new life, new name, new heart. New mind, new speech, new walk, everything. So if that's you, I'm, I'm asking you, turn to Jesus. Make him your friend. Make, he's already Lord. You, don't, you can't make him Lord of your life because he's already Lord. All you got to do is just admit it and submit to it. Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that what we've said has touched the hearts of those today who have heard. God, that you would use it to draw us closer to you. Father, teach us, even as we leave here, let these things take root. Let, they, let that seed take root and let it begin to produce fruit in our lives, Lord. That we would be more like Jesus. That we would bear good fruit. That those around us would see Christ in us. Let us be ministers to those who are in our life, Lord. Let us be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. Yes, Lord. And we ask that you keep your hand over us, watch us as we go home. Father, and we pray for those who aren't here today because of sickness, God, that you would just touch them and heal them in their bodies. Yes, Lord. Father, we ask that you would just be with us and bring us back together as your will provides that we may see your face and worship together and lift each other up in, in praise and love and peace. In 